getting. You can't always. This is the death. Remarkably him. Turn back. Towards God. Rise up. Who are we to be chosen? Our whole faith is based around these incredible mysteries. The source of love is God. God is intimately with us, and we know also that God is intimately beyond us. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, though we were sinners, into our world. mystery of silence, uh, let's consider the experience of Moses. This is chapter 3 of the book of Exodus. There the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in a flame of fire out of a bush. Moses looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. That experience of Moses before the burning bush, blazing but not consumed. Let's consider that now. Perhaps a more recent example. I remember reading not so long ago of a British astronaut when he travelled uh, in the, uh, the capsule up into space. He, he had this experience to relate. Uh, Tim Peake, his name was. He spent 185 days aboard the International Space Station in 2015-2016. Uh, he said he had a twofold experience. On the one hand, he said, life up here is absolutely spectacular, amazing views of the earth, way beyond my expectation, hard to describe. On the other hand, he observed, the most unexpected thing was the blackness of space. It is just the blackest black and you realize how small the earth is in all this blackness. That was a real surprise to me. Now, whether this astronaut realized or not, he was actually having a profound religious experience because he was both attracted to the spectacular view of the earth, but at the same time, there was a sense of, oh, the blackest of the black, almost a fearfulness came on him. This attraction but repulsion is a primal human experience and we find it very much in the scripture. Therefore, we go to Moses' experience in front of the burning bush. He's attracted to it, but he's repulsed by it. He, uh, the word is fear, it's biblical fear, not frightened, but it's too great. It's a, and we call it the word mystery. What is this? I'm attracted, but I'm, it's, it could be dangerous. So the two, one going forward, one going backwards. So there's an experience. So that's what we start to talk about when we talk about religious mystery. Not a puzzle that needs to, some, some, some scientist to come and, and to work it out for us. No, it's, it's a pool so deep that we can't fathom it and it's appealing to the depth of my being. And yet at the same time, it seems a journey too far to take. Um, so that's what we find in the scripture. Different from the astronaut, he had a cosmic experience about the stars and the, and the cosmos and the heavens, the galaxies. Uh, but this is more of a relational experience with God coming to us in the burning bush, but God coming to us now in different ways, but made face to face in Jesus. So now we come across to Mary. She's had one of these experiences of the silence of mystery in the Annunciation. We know that the Annunciation, the angel comes to her unexpectedly. There's a sense of, ah! <gasps> Uh, what's happening? What's happening? Do not be afraid, the angel says. God sent me. You are to be the mother of God. Will you be the mother of God? She's attracted, but repulsed. 
what, what an extraordinary invitation to ask me, who am I? And so she, there's, a, there's this inward, frontward and backwards going through. Even Mary, now with the relational experience that she's having, God speaking to humanity, God becoming one with humanity in all things but sin. There's the mystery of what we call the Paschal mystery, the Easter mystery, the life, death and resurrection. It's so the, the greatest of great mysteries that God becomes one with us. And yet at the other hand, who are we to be chosen? Why didn't he choose other ones? But he chose us human beings. This is an experience that we have uh, in our own prayer time, in silence, being in the presence of God, often you have that coming towards, but who am I? I think it's described beautifully by uh, Father John Main, a 20th century celebrated Benedictine priest and author, when he talks about the universal call to holiness that's mentioned so much in the Vatican II Council. He writes, we know that God is intimately with us and we know also that God is intimately beyond us. And then he says, it is only through deep and liberating silence that we can reconcile the polarities of this mysterious paradox. Reconciling these two polarities of attraction but repulsion, it's only through what he's described beautifully as liberating silence. That's what prayer is, holding it in Jesus, being present. It's not so much saying prayers or doing things, it's being in the presence of Jesus, the mystery of Jesus. That's real contemplative prayer. Deep prayer, heart speaking to heart prayer. So as we on this retreat continue to experience this stillness and silence, let us also use the word mystery, but not in a superficial understanding, but the mystery of something so deep. It's beyond us, yet at the same time, couldn't be closer to us, Jesus. So here we have our little Emmaus moment, uh, trying to make sense practically about the mystery of silence. It's an important word in theology, mystery. What does the word mystery mean to you, Hugh? Mm. I think it's about uncovering the unknown, that we're completely surrounded by mystery. In fact, our whole faith is based around these incredible mysteries. The Trinity, you know, the love that exists between the Father, the Son and the Spirit is still a mystery to us. It kind of goes beyond everything that we can comprehend. And so it's about uncovering these little glimpses of really the unknown. Yes, uncovering glimpses, but I'm glad you've mentioned that and you've mentioned about the Trinity because when we use the word mystery, I think uh, in, a, in Australia, for instance, uh, we think of a mystery detective story. You know, there's a puzzle, there's, a, there's a, something to be worked out, but we don't know it, but we're going to work it out <laughs> before the end of this, uh, before the end of this hour, this uh, detective show, we will know who the murderer is. You know, it's just a matter of, can you guess already? But no, we put that aside and I used in my sharing, Hugh, the uh, Moses in front of the burning bush. He's attracted, yet he's repulsed. And uh, I use the expression um, or the story of uh, the astronaut who beauty of seeing uh, planet Earth, at the same time, the blackness of space, uh, it's fearful, yet it's attractive. There's this tension, which is a very godly experience of silence which we often use the word awe, A-W-E, um, and people talk about the fear of God, but it's not being frightened of God, but it's exactly, in I, I'm in the mystery, I'm in the face of the mystery of something greater than me, yet I am absolutely enthralled by it and sense that my life will find a uh, its meaning in it. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm talking as a theologian there, can you make that, a little bit more comprehensible. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost like uh, the world is upside down with God. And um, and I feel like that upside down image, I mean, Paul talks about this, St. Paul talks about this a lot, that in my weakness, I am made strong. In my hurt, you heal me. You know, in my brokenness, that's where God can encounter us. That God's almost a God of the upside down. He's a God of the, um, 
of the unknown, that when we just think we've fit his revelation into our reason, he shows us something else, a new side to him that just floors us, uh, that just puts us back into that state of pure awe, pure wonder, pure adoration and love for what he has created for us. Um, I'm going to ask you something personally now, because uh, in more recent years you've, you, you've married and now you have a, a, a son. Um, the mystery, I mean, I'm talking about it rather poetically, but I wonder in your marriage and in your now being a father, this being gobsmacked by something greater than you ever thought or imagined, has that happened to you in, in these primal relationships? 100%. Or is that, is that too in, no, too personal, sorry. The, uh, <laughs> I, you are 100% correct, to the point where I'm kind of gobsmacked, still trying to think of how to articulate it. But, um, but my son, so he's currently one year old, um, and I, the love that I experience for him comes from somewhere that can only be God. And I remember um, I had him for the first three hours of his life, uh, whilst my wife was um, was just finishing up uh, some of the little little post uh, pregnancy things with the doctor, and I had him, and I was just holding him in this empty ward, and it was just the crack of dawn, um, and I remember this little life uh, that was part me, that was part my wife, that was really all God, and I was just holding him in my hands, and marveling at literally the miracle uh, that was before me and just floored for this love that erupted out of nowhere uh, that I didn't think was even possible. That was very different to the love that I had for my wife or for my friends or for my family. It was the love for this little little man. And you would describe that as a religious experience? Yeah. And if so, why is it religious and not just a lovely good man? Perhaps an atheist or a person who doesn't believe in God would have a similar experience, would they? Or is there a different dimension here? Yeah, I think because my faith, uh, because I have a faith that enriched the whole experience. And we learn, you know, 1 John 4, 8, anyone who does not know God does not know love, for God is love. That in that moment, there was this new understanding of God because it was a new experience of love uh, that I had. And knowing that the source of love is God and that God created this little man and created me to have him. It, I found a new, I guess, understanding of my vocation, a new understanding of my calling, my deep purpose in life, grounded in love, grounded in God. The saints have had similar experiences, not, not necessarily the exact one of you, but in the sense of um, being gobsmacked is used in the word use the word I mentioned a moment ago by something uh, like St. Teresa this year, she talks about the, the flowers, she's given the title, the little flower, the beauty of, of, of a rose, the, the, the fragrance of a rose, the, um, the kindness of a person who didn't have to help me, but who did, the good Samaritan who broke his or her routine or their routine and, and out of the graciousness of their heart is Jesus to me. Um, I must say, as, as a bishop and as a priest, you sort of always there giving, 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 which is fine, but sometimes something happens to me. And uh, I remember speaking to a priest recently, he got quite sick, quite sick. And he said for the first time in his life, he really didn't have the energy to give, give, give. And, and then somebody said to him, one of his priests, Father, let us love you at this moment of crisis in your life. And he was gobsmacked by this, uh, this expression. And nobody had ever said it to him, let us love you and be gracious to you. And he saw that this is an experience of Jesus for us. The mystery of silence is really an encounter of the divine and the human. And that in that there's a real presence, not absence, and a real love, not fear. And I think that speaks really well in the scripture where God is speaking to Moses through the burning bush and, and tells him that he's on holy ground, a sacred space, because it's in those sacred spaces that we really do experience um, the mystery of God and, and the mystery of God's silence and the love that's present in that. I guess I've had three real experiences of that that come to mind immediately um, when I think of this idea of the mystery of silence and God's presence in it. Um, and those three experiences, the first one was at the World Youth Day Vigil uh, evening at, in Panama in 2019. And there was a moment in this field where we, the vigil was held of 600,000 people. And you can think 600,000 people, there's going to be an awful lot of noise. There's not going to be a lot of silence. And that was true. Even from the pilgrimage to the site, there was 
constant sounds. You were just awash all the time with the sounds of all the different cultures, the languages that you were surrounded by with all these people. And it built and built and the whole day you're out on site for the full day and you're constantly just involved in this noise, um, this constant buzz and hum. And where I experienced that real presence of God though and this real, I guess, understanding of the mystery of silence was after adoration of the Blessed Sacrament, we'd all gone back to our spot to find our campsites. And we were lying there, I guess, trying to prepare yourself for a bit of sleep. And there were four people and they were leading the, the crowd, the 600,000 people, through the joyful mysteries, praying the rosary. And between each of the decades, they would, between each, between each of the mysteries, they were, uh, they were singing the Ave Maria. And it was in that moment that there was a sacred silence. And you, it's hard to explain, but you're in a, a moment and there's all these noises that you've had all through the day, and then all of a sudden they just stop. And there's just this sense of peace and of love, like described at, at the start of the chapter. Love, not fear, and presence, not absence. So that for me was the was a first moment. It was a really big moment because I was at a really interesting point in my faith journey where I'd got to that particular stage of the pilgrimage and it was it led on to further encounters. Um, the second one for me was in the Sistine Chapel in Vatican City and again you're surrounded by people, there's people everywhere, you're shoulder to shoulder with people and you think this is not a place I'm going to be able to experience uh, that sacred silence and that presence of God. That's, but you are, you're standing on holy ground like Moses was and you have to let yourself be present, I guess. And so I found a spot to sit down amongst all these hundreds of people that are crushed into the Sistine Chapel. And I found a spot to sit and be present, to rest with God and to, to look at the frescoes. And again, was able to find that, that presence and find a place of silence amongst such a busy, busy place. And so that was experience number two. And the third one was on a much smaller scale and it was at a retreat. Uh, held locally um, and there was a moment in the evening where we had adoration and it was a beautiful moment for me. I was able to spend some time, you know, resting with Jesus just there, um, knelt in front of the Blessed Sacrament. But the experience of silence came after that when I was being prayed with and there was music going around and worship and lots of things happening and lots of people were being prayed with. Um, but I had this moment where everything stopped again and there was just this stillness, this presence. I was clearly standing on holy ground. I was in a sacred space and I was able to just be with God. And, and it was in those three experiences that I was able to find that mystery of silence and understand a little bit more about it. You can never fully understand. And like John Main said uh, in this chapter, you know, we can, only, we can only understand so much. We can be intimately you know, present with God, but still understand that He's infinitely beyond us. And I guess in reflecting on that a little deeper, I was able to find a place where I could contemplate and understand the true, the true gift of grace that is the mystery of silence. My whole faith, I feel, is that living out that uh, call in the scriptures to be still and know that I'm God. And, and when it says be still, it's not just saying do nothing, uh, but it's saying let God be God and let you be you. Let God love you for who you are right here, right now. And you don't have to do anything to deserve that love. You just have to allow God to pour the love, which comes out in so many different ways, in hope, in joy, in trust, in courage, in faith, uh, in beauty. Um, but let him love you just as you are right here, right now. For us Christians, the greatest mystery of it all, now that we've spent a bit of time working up what mystery is from, yeah. from the religious biblical point of view, the greatest mystery for Christians is what we call the Easter mystery or the Paschal mystery. That the greatest gobsmacking, God's, that's not even a word, the greatest <laughs> moment that gobsmacks us all is that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, though we were sinners, into our world and became like us in all things but sin. And then through his life, death, resurrection, God then raises up Jesus. Philippians chapter 2 talks about this. This is the great boast of St. Paul, which even before the writing of that uh, wonderful letter, this was a, like a Christian hymn in the early centuries, the early 
decades of the church's paschal life. So this is the great mystery, isn't it? The mystery and the scriptures resonate with this, that the T-H-E with a big T is the mystery of Christ among you. Yeah. Our hope of glory, Emmanuel. Mm. And all these big words we use, Emmanuel. A final comment. Yeah, just on that, I um, we've come out of Easter recently and just that image. And this is the beauty of the mysteries, it never ends. And I was reflecting uh, during this Easter time on the image of God the Father in the tomb with Jesus, breathing life in this intimate moment, breathing life back into his son. When I'm holding my son and almost seeing that intimacy, that love from the father that only a father can have for his son, that, that this mystery is something that we're only just uncovering. We've only just scratched the surface. It's only one drop in this ocean of this mystery that we're uncovering. But that's the exciting thing about it, is that's what we've got for the rest of us. What a great image, a, a drop in the ocean of God's love for us. So we'll end up in just a moment, but um, I think really, Hugh, we could really encourage us all now to uh, the next, since until the next session, to think of the gobsmacked moments, the mystery moments in our life and to see God in it and to thank God. You're talking about holding your son how does Jesus hold each one of us and, and how have we recognised that perhaps through silence we can let God tell us. He's been doing that all the time. A bit like that, what is it, the footprints story, that uh, there's, there's, uh, when we thought God wasn't there, he couldn't have been more there. So let's think about that now as we move into a time of silence between now and our next session on our e-retreat. I hope you are finding it helpful. And it's just not sitting back there passively. We're all in this together, allowing Jesus to lead us through a e-retreat, not face to face, but through the miracle of modern communications. Wherever you are here in Australia or beyond, let God be with you in the mystery of his love. Heavenly Father, you are near to us, yet you are a God of mystery. Deepen your holiness, draw us to you, for we are weak, but you are strong. Draw us into that communion with you that is made present in your Son, Jesus Christ. Mary, who so much leads us to the mystery of Jesus, lead us too so that we can have communion and fellowship with the Lord God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, and we are able to use that newfound home by being present to others in service. We make this and all our prayers through Christ the Lord. Amen. Shalom World Television is coming to Australia. This is a great gift. It's been gifted to many parts of the world and now it's our Australian turn to receive it with open arms. I welcome it, I bless it. It's going to really support family life, married life, youth. Give us a resource that uh, we know that uh, we need really help in these, great help in these areas. May Almighty God bless this new resource coming to our land in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.